so I, I'd like to read a little bit of the table of contents of this book so you can get some sense of how it differs from from the first three were were really personal expressions based on on the site observations a bit of research more than a bit a fair amount but it was fresh from the job this is an old turtle's reflection on these the questions these first three books raised and what i've done in the table of contents is to basically list the main ideas that are in each chapter in an old-fashioned bookish way that i won't bother to bother you with but i wrote a little epigraph before each chapter that tries to catch the kernel the thematic kernel in that chapter and those i think might whet your appetite to work your way through a 310,000 word book. The first chapter is the prologue, and the epigraph for the prologue is the shocking possibility that dumb people do not exist in sufficient numbers to warrant the millions of careers devoted to tending them will seem incredible to you. Yet that is the central proposition of my book, that mass dumbness, which justifies official schooling, first had to be dreamed of. It isn't real. The first chapter is called The Way It Used to Be, and in that I attempt to reach back into American history and show the contrast between the expectations of young people growing up 200 years ago in this country, not globally, and what we're doing today. And the epigraph for the way it used to be is our official assumptions about the nature of modern childhood are dead wrong. Children allowed to take adult responsibilities and given a serious part in the larger world are always superior to those who were passively schooled. At the age of 12, Admiral Farragut got his first command. I was in fifth grade when I learned of that. Had Farragut attended my elementary school in Monongahela, he would have been in seventh grade. Chapter two is called An Angry Look at Modern Schooling. And the epigraph is, the secret of American schooling is that it doesn't teach the way children learn, and it isn't supposed to. It took seven years of continuous reading and reflection to finally figure out that mass schooling of the young by force was a creation of the four great coal nations of the 19th century. That's the United States, Germany, Britain, and France. Nearly a hundred years after the investiture of forced schooling in the United States, on April the 11th, 1933, the president of the Rockefeller Foundation announced to insiders that a comprehensive national program was underway to control human behavior. As I speak to you, that was 70 years ago. Chapter three, the schools, of course, were the agency to do that. Chapter three, called Eyeless in Gaza, is about the elimination of the ability to read complex material. And I specify exactly how that was carried out. Something strange has been going on in government schools where the matter of reading is concerned. Abundant data exists to show that by 1840, the incidence of complex literacy in the United States was between 93 and 100 percent, 
wherever such a thing mattered. Yet compulsory schooling existed nowhere. Between the two world wars of the 20th century, schoolmen seem to have been assigned the task of terminating our universal reading proficiency. And to spare you reading this chapter, I will tell you that under the guise of World War II, the alphabet system of teaching reading, which had worked quite brilliantly and very efficiently for hundreds and hundreds of years, was jettisoned, and it was replaced with a pictograph system where you were required to memorize the look of words rather than to sound out the parts of words. It's a system that simply doesn't work well. It works well enough for you to become an indifferent reader, but never well enough for you to pick up the books that the people who made schooling were familiar with. Chapter 4 explains why I quit, how I eventually became disgusted with what I was doing, even though I was highly honored by the system and given many, many privileges, I became so disgusted with what I was doing that I quit. I lived through the great transformation of the 1960s and watched schools turn from reasonably useful places into laboratories of state experimentation upon children, centers of scientistic pornography masquerading as pedagogical science. Treating children as individuals became anathema. The changeover was the fruit of a half century of social theory in which experts in child development spoke in averages. But there is no mass of children, only individual children. The entire great scam of sociology dealing in social averages is a hideous way to look at your family or your neighbors. There are no average children, and all the stage theories of child development, depending on averages, will bring you to grief if you attempt to employ them either with your family at home or in school. The evidence of our eyes and ears demonstrate that average men and women do not exist. It's a statistical conceit that justifies management. In chapter 5, which is the second part of the book, I try to discover and uncover the foundations of schooling and also the kind of human temperament that would lead to this, this fashion of an institution. This chapter is called True Believers in the Unspeakable Chautauqua. I took the uh, locution True Believers from a, a book by Eric Hoffer, the San Francisco longshoreman who had a, a vogue in the national eye of about five years in, I believe, the early 1960s. He wrote these very slim, highly intellectual, and quite fresh, freshly thought uh, considerations of American national life. And his last book, and probably his most famous, which has been continuously in print for the last 40 years, is The True Believer. The expression actually comes from uh, St. Augustine in a book about, uh, about war, I believe. From start to finish, school as we know it is a tale of true believers and how they took the children to a land far away. All of us have a tiny element of true believer in our makeup 
You have only to reflect on some of your own wild inner urges and see the lunatic gleam that comes into your own eye on those occasions to begin to understand what happens when obedience to those kinds of impulse are made a permanent condition of management. Chapter 6 goes even deeper into this true belief phenomenon and examines the utopian impulse as it occurred globally, but as it particularly occurred in the United States. In the middle of the 19th century, we had well in excess of 1,000 utopian colonies all over the United States. And just, just for pure pleasure, I'd urge you to pick up one of the many books available that deal with the different sorts of utopian community. Because the experimentation on human nature that was undertaken in those communities was borrowed, it was abstracted and utilized by government agencies. The lure of utopia, presumably humane utopian interventions, like compulsion schooling, which is supposed, after all, to be for the good of children, aren't always the blessing they appear to be. For instance, the invention of the safety lamp saved thousands of coal miners from gruesome death, but it wasted many more lives than it ever rescued, because without that invention, the coal industry would have always remained a peripheral business. They would scrape the surface and leave the rest of it alone. The safety lamp allowed the subterranean depths of the earth to be dug out in little narrow tunnels and the miner to be relatively safer in those tunnels than he would have been, but if he hadn't have been able to see in those tunnels, he never would have gone into them in the first place. The lamp alone allowed the coal industry to grow rapidly, exposing miners to mortal danger from which there is no good protection. In the year 2000, after an era of safety lamps and other scientific progress, 6,000 miners were lost to cave-ins and explosions in Russia alone. That's twice the death toll of the World Trade Center disaster in New York. What Sir Humphrey Davy, the inventor, accomplished with his lamp was a great gift, but not to coal miners. It was a great gift to coal producers. 